thanks for clicking in. We upload videos every week, so be sure to subscribe so that you can receive your encouragement. And as you are listening in, you may feel led to connect with the ministry. So you can check out our description for different ways on how to do so. And you may also sow into our ministry using the various ways that we have to give. Your giving goes to all of the outreaches that we conduct all throughout the month, every month. Now, let's listen in. I don't know how many are like me, but, you know, I'm not really good at, at waiting, you know. I, I, I trust in God for overflow, and I trust in God for every single promise that he has given my life and to me concerning my life. I, I trust him. I really trust him. But I don't, like, I don't like waiting. I don't like waiting. I don't like sermons on waiting. I like sermons on right now. One clap and God's going to do it. You know, that kind of before you leave, it's going to happen. I like those sermons. I don't like the sermons that say that God could make you wait like Abraham. You know, till you're 99 years old. And I, I don't like those promises like a Moses where God's going to use you. But Moses, you're going to be 80 years old before I get to you. I don't like those promises. I don't like those promises like, you know, that were made to Israel that they were going to come out a great nation but have to wait 400 years in bondage in Egypt. I don't, I don't like waiting for, for promises. Waiting is, to me, is, is, is torture. And, and like I said, I believe in all the promises of God. We, we've been banking on it the last few weeks. That is the promises of God. And, and the theme scripture for this series is 2 Corinthians 7, 1, where Paul said the promises of God are yes and, and amen. All the promises of God are, are yes and amen. So when God gives you a promise, that promise is yes and amen. God does not change his mind. God does not, you know, turn his ways and say, oh, oh, you know, that was a bad call. No, when God gives you a promise, it is yes and amen. But often it's that weight that causes most people to miss the promise because the weight is, is not fun. The weight is what separates the real from the fake. And don't get it twisted. That there is a weight that you can expect for. The Bible says everything that God does, Ecclesiastes 3.1 says this, everything that God does, there is a time and a season for. Every promise God has given us, there is a season for it to happen. There's a season for you to be married. There's a season for you to be single. There's a season for you to be healed. There may be a season for you to be sick. There, there's a season where money won't be a problem. There may be a season where the ATM is making you want to punch it. <laughs> the, the, everything has a season. In marriage, there's good times. There's bad times. Don't believe anybody that says it's always good. You know, we're just always in love. It's just all... Liar. My kids just never give me any problem. Liar. Everything has a season. You cannot avoid it. There is a season. But, but here's the promise God gives later on in Ecclesiastes. He says, but understand this. Everything will be made beautiful. In not my time. His time. So God says, no matter what it looks like right now, and I know it may be hard right now, and I know your heart may be ripped out of your chest right now, and I know you may not have any more tears left in the tear ducts, but God says, my promise to you is that everything will be made beautiful before it's all said and done. Habakkuk says this in Habakkuk 2.3. He says, you know, the vision that God gave you, the promise is for an appointed time. In the end, it will speak and not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it 
will surely come and not tarry. And lastly, the word says, be not weary in well-doing in Galatians 6, 9. For in due season you will reap if, there it is, you don't quit. If you faint not. When God gives a promise, you can bank on it. But that waiting, I know, can be hard. But there are some things that God waits for in the process. It's been said that we're waiting on God, but actually I've learned in time that it's never that I'm waiting on God. It's usually that God is waiting on me. And one of the things that God waits for in, in the process of making you wait for a promise is he waits for training to take place. See, see there's something about the weight that trains your faith. There's something about the weight that, that makes you into the kind of person that can handle the magnitude of the promise that's coming. God trains you for it. And the longer the wait, the greater the promise. For those that have been waiting for a long time, it doesn't mean that God's forgotten about you. It just means that the promise is that big and you could not handle it right now it would crush you so what God is doing is he is training you to be able to handle it while nobody's around so you look like a pro when everybody's around one day he waits for training what else does God wait for he he waits for toughness can you handle the pain that comes with a promise. We talked about Mary giving birth to Jesus and all she had to go through. Can you handle the pain that comes with the promise? Are you emotionally, mentally, spiritually tough enough for what you're praying for? Because you pray for the promise, but can you prepare yourself or handle the fact that one out of every 12 people that come into your life will be a Judas? Do you have the capacity to know that they're going to betray you and still wash their feet with the rest? That takes a level of toughness and a level of maturity. Are you tough enough? For the promise that God has for your life. God waits for transformation. He waits for the butterfly to, be, to, to, to grow up and no longer be the caterpillar. He waits for transformation. That's what the Jordan River is all through the Bible. It is the place of transformation. It is the place where this becomes that. Where the Hebrew people go from being a, a, a people with no country to a people with a country. It's the place where, where Jesus became a no, went from being a nobody to becoming the, the Lord and Savior to the world. It's the Jordan River where this becomes that it is the place of transformation and often what God looks for when you're praying for a promise is do I see a new you when I look at you or are you just a Christian version of the old you he looks for transformation he looks for you to get to the place where you no longer look like what you've been through he looks for transformation in your life and this is why you got to take your growth serious because until he sees that transformation, you're not ready for the promise yet. He looks for trust. Can he trust you with a promise? That's number one. Will the promise take you away from him? Will the promise take you away from church? I often say this. Until you establish what you won't do to succeed and be happy, you're not ready for a promise. Because once you establish what you won't do, well, I won't do this if I meet the right guy. I won't do this if I meet the right girl. I won't do this if I get the job. I won't do this. I won't do that. Until you establish what you won't do, then if God gave you a promise, you'll do anything to keep it. It's trust. Can God trust you? But also, do you have crazy 
trust in God even when things don't go the way you want them to go? Can you trust God in your darkest hours? Because guess what? Even though you're hurting, life has to still go on. And so you have to make a decision. Is this the period to your story? Or are there still some promises that even though you're hurting and even though you're broken, there are still some things God has for my life. So even in my pain, I have to trust him. Look at somebody and say, don't lose trust. It's trusting him. Job said it like this. The Lord giveth, yet will I trust him. It's trust. It's trust. And lastly, God waits for transition. Transition. People that live and walk in the promises of God often see their lives going through many transitions. Transitions with family, transitions with friends, transitions with your job. Being a promised person that's walking in a promise, you have to get used to your life always transitioning. If you need everything to stay the same, you're not ready. Because the minute goodness comes into your life, the minute favor comes into your life, everything in your life begins to shift because there has to be uniformity. You cannot be a great person living in poor circumstances. So what God does is he begins to transition you so that what you see on the outside matches the magnitude of the promise on the inside. Transition. But God has a way of waiting for these things. And so, yes, it's hard, and yes, it's painful. But there are seasons and times where you have to just wait it out. Wait it out. But on the other hand, there are times in life where you can make God bless a rule and even break his time frame in your life. There's a time and a season, yes. In due seasons, I will reap if I faint not, yes. But what if I were to tell you there is a way to make God expedite your promise? Expedite something that he didn't plan to give you for another 20 years. But let me share this with you. In the expedition, all of the principles that I just showed you are demonstrated in a moment. This is what Jesus would show us in his first real public appearance after the Jordan River. His first miracle that would get people's attention would be him performing something that was out of time. It says in John chapter 2 that we find Jesus going to a party. Th this is his first time stepping into the public scene as the Messiah in a lot of ways. And he finds himself at a party. Now, the party is not necessarily what shocks me. But it's where it's placed in the book of John. Because when you open the book of John, it starts off really deep about Jesus. John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. You know, the same was in the beginning with God. He's saying that before anything was anything, God had his word, and it was the word and God, and they were chilling. God had his word. That's why if you have a Bible, you should be careful how you treat it, because when you hold your Bible, you are actually holding God's word. Amen. Amen. And he says that all things were made by him. I like that, be because if all things were made by him, it doesn't surprise me when he says, I can work all things together for your good. 
because if he made all things, he can get me all things. There is no thing that God can't get me because all things were made by him and through him and without him was not anything made that was made. He says in him was life and the life was the light of, of men and the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. He goes on to say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacled in verse 14. He, he tabernacled among us. He starts off so heavy. And then he shares about the baptism. And he, he shares about Jesus building his, his, his Genesis core team. And then we see Jesus going to a party. I think in a lot of ways, God is, is starting off by showing us in the beginning where his heart is. It doesn't surprise me that it starts off with a wedding be, because the first man and woman created, he performed a wedding. Revelations says that in the end, there will be a great wedding. Maybe Jesus is starting with the end in mind. He also tells us that the marriage in itself is a reflection of, of Christ and the church in the book of Ephesians. Look, look, look at what Ephesians 5 says. It says, why submit yourselves to your own husbands, not to somebody else's, not to your boss, but submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. That, that means God says how you treat your husband is how God sees you treating him. God says, don't talk a good game and disrespect him because he is your visual. He is your practice for me. So submit, 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 submit yourselves to, 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 to your husband. And a lot of times when you have a husband that's hard to submit to, what God is doing is he's trying to grow your faith through your prayer life. He, he's trying to show you that I can still Moses change the heart of a Pharaoh. And so sometimes God will give you somebody stubborn, not because he needs you to fix them, but he's using them to fix you. So wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the whole body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in some things. Mm. In everything. I know this ain't fun. I get it. I get it. I get it. But, but the reason we got to get it is because this is the image of Christ in the church. The husband is the representation of Christ. The wife is the representation of the church. And the children represent the unsaved world. And so if the relationship with God and the church is off, how can you expect the children to come to Jesus? It is a reflection. It is a reflection. It is a reflection. And, and so he, he says, now husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Here's where it gets catchy because he never tells the wife to love the husband. Right. She don't love me. She was never told to love you. And the reason God does this is he doesn't give anybody all the power. So yes, she has to submit to you. But if she stops loving you, say goodbye to the passion in the marriage. She will submit, but you will no longer be her hero. So husbands, love. Love thinks no evil. Love plans no evil. Love doesn't bring up the past. Love, 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 love. Love hung up high and stretched out wide. Love, love, love. Love didn't quit till love stopped, stopped breathing. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, he gave his life for what he loved. Ladies, stop dating people that never give nothing. My giving is a reflection of my heart. 
He says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present himself a glorious church, not having a spot or a wrinkle. What he's saying is, husbands, she is what has come out of your mouth. If you don't like the bed that you're laying in, change the way you talk to her. If you water her with the word, she will become a glorious church. A glorious church is a church that has word in it. Oh, I have you, ladies. See, it wasn't all on you. I had you too. He says that he might present himself a glorious church, not having a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Whenever a man does not love a woman right, it is clear that he does not love himself right. I cannot love you if I don't love me. And Paul goes on to say this later on. He says, you know, this right here is the cause that a man shall leave his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they sh shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ in the church. He's not even talking about marriage. He's talking about Christ in the church. He says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular love his wife as himself. He's actually talking about how the church is supposed to respond when Jesus speaks. He, he, he's trying to teach how to keep the relationship right with God. So it doesn't surprise me that Jesus comes into a wedding. A marriage was at the beginning. A, a marriage will be at the end. A, a marriage is, is, is natural here on earth. And, and the six vessels that will be filled up Six is the number of man, and the Bible says we are all but empty vessels. So, so I get it that, that man, the dirty pots that will be filled, man is nothing but a dirty pot filled with God. But when God fills man up, it's not about what man looks like on the outside. It's about the water turning to wine on the inside. And wine is symbolic to the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul says, don't be drunk with wine in Ephesians 5, 18. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. And when the apostles came out of the upper room, they said, they are drunk. Because the Holy Spirit, in a lot of ways, is always compared to wine. But I'm not going to focus on the deep stuff of this text. I just want to focus on how to get God to make a promise happen quick. So Jesus makes his way to a party. And it says in John chapter 2, verse 1, it was the third day, third day. Oh, wait a minute. Third day, third day. What, what did the third day in the tomb create? It was the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the Bible wants us to know that Jesus' mother was there. It doesn't always highlight Mary being there. And, and this is actually, biblically, Mary's first public appearance in 18 years. Mary was there. It is important that Mary was there. Like, it is important that we always have somebody in every area of our life that is connected to God. Sometimes things don't happen in our lives because everybody that surrounds us has no connection to God. I am glad that they have somebody at the party that is connected to God. And as we move forward, I get a chance to see what made Mary so special to God. Way back at 13 or 14 when she got pregnant, I'm starting to see some characteristics in her that, that I really didn't get a chance to see early on in her life. Maybe it was there in the beginning or maybe she grew into it. But she's at the party, and here's how you know somebody is a good, godly leader. When they see a problem, they see it as their, 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 their duty to fix it. See, sometimes people go in and look for problems and go on Google Review and write about them. 
But I love people that see a problem and say, maybe God sent me here to be the solution. Maybe the reason I see it is because God planted me here and I see it and others don't see it. Or if others see it, they're not taking it to God. But maybe God sent me here to be the solution to the problem. They're partying because in, in biblical days, a wedding would last weeks. And there would be lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of alcohol. There was so much alcohol that when they ran out, they would just start mixing it with water to get to the end. They have such a shortage of wine that they are beyond mixing it with water. They are completely out. Have you ever been in a place in life where you should be happy, but something hits you that has you completely empty? I'm sure the husband and the wife did not see this coming or else they would not have prepared a wedding at this point in their life. They had to have thought, we are good. We are solid. Everything is together. And then life hits. And I'm glad that when life hits, Mary was there. Who's the Mary in your life when life hits? Because the others may be freaking out, but Mary knows where to go. She sees Jesus coming. And there's something about a problem in life and how it quickly changes when you can see Jesus coming. Jesus is coming with his team. And here's the thing. When Jesus is coming, the problem will not stay a problem for long. When Jesus is coming, the healing has to be given. When Jesus is coming, good times are on the way. When Jesus is coming, it won't be like this for long. Look at somebody and say, Jesus is coming. She sees Jesus coming. And she goes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. They, they got a marriage but they have no wine. They got a lot of people, but they have no wine. They got the venue, but they have no wine. I've learned in life to never get so stuck at staring at people and thinking that they have it so good. Because most of the time, the people you think have it good, they only look good, but they have no wine. She says, Jesus, they have no wine. Not me. They, they have no wine. God put me here to spot the wine shortage. Like God put our ministry here to spot the wine shortage in our area. To look at all the people that have a wedding and have a party and have the guests, but they have no wine. And she runs to Jesus and she says, they have no wine. And Jesus responds back to his mother. Woman, what have I to do with the my hour has not come yet that means Jesus did not go to the wedding to perform Jesus went to the wedding to chill <laughs> it'd be one thing if he said in just a little bit of time this will he said I have no plans to perform today I am here to chill because Jesus Though he didn't get caught up with the people, he did not run from where the people are. I'm tired of church people that expect people to only get saved by having church services. Jesus did not expect people to come to him. He went to where they were. And you got to be careful 
I've learned this from people I look up to. You got to be careful because the minute you start trying to do Jesus ministry, it's not that you ever done it. But the minute you start trying to go after people that church people would never try to save, what church people tend to do is just categorize you with them. And Jesus would have this reputation in his ministry. Read your Bible of being called a drunkard. So you have to be careful because when you try to do Jesus ministry, the religious people will always try to crucify you. Jesus did not go to the party to perform. He went to the party to chill. And Mary sees her son and says, I need you to make something happen for them. And he responds with, my time is not now. In other words, this is not the timing for a blessing. This is not the timing for a promise. And for some, this is where we get discouraged because we hear God tell us no. But I love people that refuse to take no for an answer. Lord, I'm going to do whatever it takes to change your no into a yes. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this no to a yes with my marriage. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this no to a yes with my child. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this no to a yes with my money. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this no to a yes with my singleness. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this no to a yes with this sickness. God, I am determined in this season to take your no and turn it into a yes. God, if you're going to do it, I need you to get on with it because I refuse to take no for an answer. Say, I'm not settling for it. I'm not settling for it. Jesus, they need you. Mary, no. <laughs> and I love what Mary does. She doesn't even go back and forth. See, my mother would go back and forth with me. She would say, remember, I brought you into this world. I can take you out of this world. You, you know, Mary doesn't even talk to Jesus no more. She looks at the servants. She doesn't look at the spectators because they're still dancing. They're still drinking on fumes. She looks to the servants. And here's how you know somebody is a true servant. She says, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, submit. Whatever he says to you, don't give kickback. But whatever he says to you, just do it. See, this is how you get God to do something quick. As long as you say, well, I'm not there yet. Uh, I can't do it yet. You know, I'm just not ready. It's okay, but get used to the wait. It don't make you a bad person. It just means you're a person that's not ready. But when you get this mentality that says, whatever God tells me to do, I want my promise so bad. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to do it with the time or without the time. I'm going to do it with the healing or without the healing. I'm going to do it with the money or without the money. I want it so bad that I'm going to do whatever it takes, whatever is said, whatever I read in the word, I am going to do what Ever he tells me to do because I want my promise that bad. Do you want your promise so bad that you'll start doing whatever God tells you to do? If he tells you to tithe, you tithe. If he tells you to serve, you serve. If he tells you to read, you read. If he tells you to go to outreach, you go to outreach. Do you want it so bad that you won't give God kickback, but whatever he says to do, you're going to put on your Nikes and just 
do it. This is a just do it kind of season. This is a season for hungry people. This is a season for desperate people to just do it. I don't care if I lose the house. I don't care if I lose the car. I don't care if I lose the relationship. I don't care if I lose the friends, but I'm just going to do it because I can't stay sick any longer. I can't stay broke any longer. I can't stay lonely any longer. I can't stay miserable any longer. I can't stay depressed anymore. This is my season to just do it. Say, just do it. What is God calling you to just do it with in this season? Because you can keep making excuses, but until you make adjustments, you are in the waiting room. And eventually he will get you there. But the problem is you'll be 70 looking back saying, I could have got this 30 years ago. If I just would have did it. She says, whatever he says to you, just do it. And there were six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews. The, these are dirty water pots. These are where people would wash up. They're dirty. It's six of them. And I said this earlier, six is the number of man. And these in a lot of ways are symbolic to man. We are dirty vessels. And there are six, which is the number of man. They are containing two or three firkins a, a, a piece. Total, total, with all of them is about 180 gallons. Jesus says, fill the water pots with water. And they fill them to the brim. He, he looks at the servants the water pots can't fill themselves. He looks to the servants. Do you realize when you pull into the parking lot and you step in through our lobby and you hear people sing and people seat you and people are with your kids in the back, they are the servants filling water pots. This is why I remember the story of the widow woman and it says as long as she brought vessels, they kept getting filled. But once one vessel was filled, they pushed it to the side and, and started on another one. That's the job of the church, to keep filling vessels. And it says that when the vessel stopped coming, the oil stopped flowing. If you want the oil to stop flowing here at Uproar, just stop inviting your friends and family. The servants had the responsibility to fill the water pots. The water pots had the responsibility of not leaking that which was dumped into them out. It was a back and forth relationship. They had to allow themselves to be filled. Are you allowing yourself to be filled? Because God is not caught up in how dirty you are. He just wants to see how willing are you to allow somebody to help fill you. So he says to the servants, I want you to fill them. Not three quarters of the way. Not half. I want all six water pots filled to the brim. That means I want them filled to the point where they cannot be filled with any more water. See, see, that's what being filled is. God fills you so much that there's no room for anything not like him in your life. He says, I want them filled to the brim. I, I want them filled a 100 Percent. I don't want room for nothing else. I don't want room for anything to creep in. I don't want room for anything to contaminate this. I want them filled to the brim. And, and see, I, I know at some point they had to have gotten frustrated. Because what the Bible doesn't tell us, but I've been there, so I've seen it myself. From where this miracle took place, there's a church now, but where this miracle took place, from where it took place to the well 
they had to go to was a two-mile walk. And all they could carry is maybe two buckets each trip. Each bucket would have been able to hold between maybe two to three gallons. This would have been back and forth for miles looking at everybody else singing and partying up on the hill. Back hurting, sweating, blisters on my hands from going back and forth. And I got to keep doing this over and over and over. And Jesus isn't even helping them. Because the teacher never helps the student when it comes to passing a test. I, I gave you the order. Fill them to the brim. And Jesus steps back and shuts up. He's letting us know that every miracle, every promise received requires our effort as well. And if you're asking me to give you this thing before your time, I want to see that you're willing to work for it. So fill it to the brim. Are you willing to work for what you're asking for? And they keep going back and forth. And I'm sure when they filled the fifth one up, they had expectation that maybe he'll give it to me early. And maybe when they got three quarters of the way full on the sixth one, they were starting to get a little frustrated on that last walk back. This ain't going to happen. Have you ever been throwing your life at something and wanted to quit? And I think that's where a lot of people are today. And I think that what God wants you to know is no matter how much you want to quit, pour a little more. Pour a little more. Pour a little more even though it don't look like nothing's happening. Pour a little more even though it doesn't look like change is coming. Pour a little more even though the letters are piling up from the collectors. Pour a little more even though their words keep cutting you to the core. Pour a little bit more even though you lost that loved one. Whatever you do, don't stop pouring. You could be one pour away from your whole life having transformation. You could be one pour away from every promise coming into your life. Look at somebody and say, pour a little more. Whatever you do, don't stop pouring. You could be one bucket full away from God breaking a rule and giving you a promise early. They kept Pouring, and they said, Jesus, after the last bucket, we poured the last bucket worth of water. All six are filled to the brim. What do we do now? Nothing happened, Jesus. And Jesus says, draw out. Bear to the governor of the feast. They filled the water pots up. But I don't know if you've ever filled something up to the brim. But if you try to put a cup in your hand, then what happens? Jesus is saying, if you want overflow now, this is going to require you walking by faith and trusting in the water I've put inside of you. It's not enough just to be a doer. Faith without is dead. I need to see that you trust that I'm able to do this. And so they poured it out. They put the cup in, they pulled it out. And I don't know where it happened. But somewhere between the water pots and the governor, 
the cup turned to wine. See, see, this is why no matter what life hits you with, you can't stop walking by faith. It may not happen on step one, and it may not happen on step two, but God says by the time you get there, I promise the promise is going to be in your hands. They, 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 they kept walking, and the water was transformed right in front of them. And it says it was so powerful that, that, that the governor, the ruler of the feast, he tasted it. He tasted not wine, the water that was made wine. Letting us know this, this is from God. This, this isn't just some cup somebody brought them. This is the water that, that, was not, that was made into wine. But he didn't know where it came from. But the servants which drew the water knew. See, see, this is what happens when you do whatever God tells you to do. While everybody else is questioning things, you have a surety on where the wine comes from. They can tell you it's not real. They can tell you your faith don't work. But when you've been serving and making it happen, they can tell you all they want to tell you. They can think all they want to think. But there's something about a servant that knows where the wine comes from. When God gives you the promise, he needs to know that even if the world doesn't know, that you know where the promise came from. That even if your friends don't know, that you know where the man came from. That you know where the woman came from, that you know how the kids got it right, that you knew where the healing came from, that you know where the money comes from, because until you know where it comes from, when he asks for it, you won't give it back to him, you'll fight him over it. Once I realize it came from God, God will never have to compete with me for it. The servants knew where it came from. It's not going to come from your college degree. It's not going to come from your connections. It's not going to come from your friends. It's not going to come from your spouse. Until you understand where it comes from. You're not ready for it. You think getting an extra job is it? Until you know where it comes from. You think creating another profile on the app is going to get it? Until you know where it comes from. The servants knew. And they said, you know, every man at the beginning sets forth good wine. And when men have gotten drunk, well drunk, that's what that means. They bring out that which was worse. You know, you get everybody drunk off the good stuff. And then when they're drunk, they don't know they're drinking watered down stuff. That's what he's saying. But you have kept the good wine till now. See, this gives us a behind-the-scenes view or understanding of how God operates. See, the world gives the best in the beginning and phases out towards the end. Like, like, like dating, you tend to get the best of a person in the beginning. And then you get the dirty underwear in the bathroom towards the end. But he says, you've saved the best for the end. To every person that's waiting on a promise, God says, I've saved the best to the end. The season you are about to step into is going to be your best season. God says the season you're going to step into is, is going to be your brightest season season. It is going to be a season full of love you've never experienced. A season full of relationships you've never experienced. Opportunities you've never experienced. God says I have saved the best 
for last. Only God can do this. And this was the beginning of the miracles in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This was the beginning. Why did God want this to be the beginning? Because he wanted us to see that the beginning of glory in your life always starts with doing whatever it takes to experience God, to get on with it with your promise. The beginning of glory always starts when you have a mindset to do whatever he tells you to do. What is God telling you to do? Now, some people are going to leave and still make excuses. And you can stay in the waiting room. But I have a feeling there are some people here and there are some people online that God is saying, do you want me to get on with it? Do you want me to make that promise come into your life now? Because all things are under God's control. He can give it now or he can give it later. But what he's looking for is somebody that has the mentality to say, God, whatever it takes, I'm not fighting it. I would rather lose this and lose that. I, I, I would rather have to change how I carry myself or how my appearance looks for a season. Whatever it takes, I, I want to see you get on with it with my life. And Jesus says, I will, if you'll do whatever I tell you to do. But Lord, it may hurt my back like carrying the buckets. How bad do you want it? But, 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 but Lord, I, I, I'm going to sweat in this hot Judean climate. How bad do you want it? Lord, I'm going to have blisters on my hands and they're going to hurt every time I pick up something for days. How bad do you want it? Because if you'll do whatever he tells you to do and do it to the brim, do it till you get to the place where you can say, Lord, I've done all that I could do to stand and now I'm standing. Mm -hmm. Most people, if you're honest, you really haven't done everything. And this message is designed for the person that needed some instruction because you don't think you could go another year Seeing the wedding not have wine. Seeing the marriage not have wine. Seeing what you love not have wine. Seeing the account not have wine. And God is saying today transformation is available. But I'm going to give it to somebody that's willing to do whatever I tell you to do. And, and notice... The one that was setting them up for the miracle was Mary. You know, I have all kinds of good men in my life now. Strong men. Strong men. But it wasn't always the case. When I got started in ministry, people gave me a title. Because really they just saw that I was youthful and the kids loved me. And they made me a youth pastor. But the men never really invested in me because a lot of them were intimidated by me. Because I was learning and I was getting in Bible college and that intimidated a lot of them. And so this lady who was married to our assistant pastor named Miss Harriet, she took me under her wing. And Miss Harriet started telling me how to carry myself like a minister. And Miss Harriet would straighten up my tie before I walked into the building. And Miss Harriet would tell me, you know, what I should be talking about in the room. And 
because her husband was the assistant pastor, so she had behind-the-scenes information. So she would tell me what to read during the week, and she, she would prep me. She would tell me when I was being foolish. She, she was telling me as a young single youth pastor at 22 and 23 when I was carrying myself inappropriately and maybe sending off mixed signals. She, she held me accountable as a young man. And I was so hungry for God that I never said, you're just a woman. Why are you talking to me? I wanted it so bad that whoever the Lord sent into my life, put it this way. I knew that my wedding had no wine. And I was desperate for anybody, even if it was a Mary. A Mary pointing me to a Jesus that was going to make me give him my whole life. A Mary pointing me to a Jesus that was going to require me to give things I didn't want to give. I didn't care who it was. That's why people get caught up on who. I don't care if you're purple. I don't care if you're yellow. If you're the best heart surgeon, I want you to operate on me. I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you can talk. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care if you run around every night from bedroom to bedroom. If, if you're the best doctor, you're the one I want. If, if you're the best physician, you're the one I want. If you put an engine in and I'll never have a problem, I don't need to know what you do. All I know is, you got the hands and the skill to keep me from coming to, to the shop. When it comes to a preacher, I don't care where you went to school. I don't care where you grew up. All I need to know is that you got a word that can help my life, a word that can transform me, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. I don't care. All of that don't matter. All I know is my wedding is running out of wine and I need help. And until you get to the place where you will appreciate who God's sending into your life that can bring Jesus into the wedding, you're never going to get to the promise that God has for you in the time frame that you can enjoy it. So to every person that is saying, Lord, these bad days, I'm ready for you to get on with it. This loneliness, I'm ready for you to get on with it. This money stuff, I am ready for you to get on with it. God is saying to you, can I get you to throw your life in empty vessels until they're filled to the brim? Yes, you're going to see other people partying and feel like you're missing out. People told me when I was in my 20s and I started this church, they told me I, I, I was throwing away the best years of my life because I, I didn't just blow up overnight. My car got repossessed twice. I lost my place and people were saying, you're miserable, you're in your 20s. But what they didn't realize is I wasn't miserable because yeah, I didn't have the stuff, but I had wine. Yeah. <laughs> and I was truly happy. In, in those seasons, and sometimes happier then than I've been when everything was well. But they said, you're wasting the best years of your life. You're struggling so much. But what they didn't realize was I was working towards something, and I was giving God what he asked for me. And yes, I saw other people doing well and buying their homes and taking trips and all this stuff. And, and it was frustrating, but I kept throwing my life at filling vessels. And eventually, I don't know how it happened, but I stepped into a transformation. And God wants you to step into a transformation today. But it comes down to what is the thing he wants from you? And do you have the courage to step away from the party and give your life to the service 
of making the party happen for everybody else.